Well, after a long time of delaying and procrastinating, I have finally built my own sound panels. Let's talk about why you might need a sound panel, different materials for what to include inside of your sound panel, and uh, ways to save money by building these things on your own. I suppose this calls for a declaration of this being another episode of Studio Quest, the quest for a better studio. It's taken me a while to finally make my own sound panels, and the two main delays have always been cost, and also just getting stuck in the research phase of finding a safe material that wouldn't cause any health concerns. First of all, there really is nothing economical about acoustic panels. No matter how you skin it, they are a luxury item. Even if you make them yourself and save some money, they still are going to cost a decent amount. But depending on your needs, they might be essential for your studio. I myself wanted to just clean up some of the sounds in my studio and cut back on some of the reflections, which come up when I'm recording live vocals or live instrumentation. And I also do a lot of talking head videos like this, and while it is easy to fix a lot of reflection problems in post, it's also nice to just front that up front, not have to do more audio processing and not have those problems in the first place. An important distinction for yourself to consider is whether you're trying to soundproof your studio space or just have some sound absorption in your studio space. Sound absorption is intended to reduce the reflection of sound off of hard surfaces, basically reducing the reverb in your room, whereas soundproofing is actually completely sealing off your room so that no noise from the outside leaks in and no noise from the inside leaks out, which can be nice if you're not trying to be a nuisance to your neighbors. Adding sound absorption can definitely reduce the amount of noise that leaves out of a room because it is absorbing some of it, but it's not going to soundproof your room by any means. Take for instance, you could in theory have a metal box and the outside of that metal box be completely soundproof, but the inside is still metal walls, so when you're inside that room, the noise is just reflecting off of every single surface, and uh, it is not sound absorbing at all, but it is soundproof. In this video, as we talk about sound panels, it's as it relates to sound absorption and not soundproofing. For my purposes, I'm not in a very large room. This is sort of the space. It's carpeted. It has some pretty thick curtains and also has this giant futon in it. So there's some natural elements to the room that already have some sound absorption. And I don't really get a ton of egregious reflections, but they are still there and I would like to clean mine up. If you find yourself in a much bigger space and have a lot of hard surfaces, especially if there's a hard floor, then you will probably find reflections being a huge detriment to any of your studio recordings or even just interfering with your mixing and mastering. So having some sort of sound panels up will really make a significant impact on your space. Before we dive too much into the materials, I want to cover a more technical aspect, which is really crucial to anything related to sound absorption, which is NRC. NRC stands for Noise Reduction Coefficient and is probably the most important metric when measuring sound absorption. It essentially determines how much noise is absorbed by your material. If something is a zero, it essentially reflects all the noise back from that surface and doesn't have any sound absorption at all. An example would be, say, marble. The higher the rating, the better, with the goal of hitting one, which is full sound absorption. And what's fun is that every surface material can actually be measured for their NRC. Drywall, for instance, can have an NRC rating of 0.15. Knocking is not a metric of measuring NRC. Thick carpeting can have a rating of 0.4. This futon has to be like a 0.8 at least. Ah! Confirmed. Even these cheap little foam panels you can find everywhere have an NRC rating, although they're usually not very great, and these are probably the worst bang for your buck when it comes to NRC ratings. And most material found inside of your sand panels, sand panels, and most of the material found inside of your sound panels usually is between 0.95 and 1, which is why they're so great. The full rating for something is actually its average rating across the full spectrum of sound and how it's rated for low frequencies, mid frequencies, and high frequencies. When looking up NRC ratings for just your common sound panels, you'll find they all pretty much perform really well in the mids and high frequencies, but they all really struggle to absorb the low end frequencies. This is where bass traps come into play. They are often a much thicker and denser foam, and they're usually stuck in the corners of your room, and they complement the sound absorption to your panels, which are getting a lot of the highs and mids. I don't have bass traps at the moment, and I don't really plan on having them super soon, but if your goal is to do really precise mixing and mastering work off your monitors and you do happen to be in a space that has a lot of really intense reflections, then bass traps might also be something that you might want to also look into on top of your regular sound panels in your wall. When deciding on the type of material to use as the insulation inside of your sound panel, there really are a few considerations to consider. But the two I focused on most were budget and safety. The two most popular materials are mineral wool and fiberglass. My gripe with these materials is that they do have 
fibers on them that are harmful if they shed off and are inhaled. They can be bad for your respiratory system. And also they're just a skin irritant. So when you're handling them, you have to take some extra safety precautions. You can completely wrap these materials when you're creating your panels by putting fabric on the back as well to contain any fibers that might break off. However, this just adds to the cost because you need more material. And also you need the safety equipment to handle the material while you're assembling your panels. I will acknowledge though that fiberglass and mineral wool are very applauded for their extreme fire resistance. However, if there's a fire in my studio, then something else has gone catastrophically wrong, and I don't think having fire-resistant panels on my wall is going to make much of a difference at that point. But having lights and LEDs behind your panel is definitely a vibe that people like to go for a lot, so if that's something you want to have, or if there's any other electronics that are sort of adjacent to your panel, then maybe that fire resistance is something you want to consider. But otherwise, I decided on these two-inch cotton bats. Not only were they one of the most affordable options, but they're also safe to handle and their NRC ratings are pretty much the same as their mineral wool and fiberglass counterparts. I could put a link down below for these exact bats, but what's available to you might change depending on what country you're living in. And if you can find somewhere locally to actually go drive and pick these up, you'll save a lot of money on shipping. Now let's move on to how we made these things. Once you've decided on your material, it is time to construct your frame. This might be intimidating to a lot of people, but with just a really basic tool set, it's actually pretty easy. At the minimum, to make the frame, all you would need is a drill with some drill bits, a miter box, and a saw. And to upholster the fabric, just some good fabric scissors, as well as just a little handheld staple gun to get these bigger staples in here. When it comes to constructing your panel, there are exactly 142 ways to go about it, and this is the way that I did it. I opted for a basic wood frame, which I constructed out of some cedar that I had in the shop. The cedar I had on hand was actually leftover fencing cedar from a fence I built with my uncle in the summer, but the price was right because he gave me all the excess cedar for free, so it's just the material I had available. It is rough on both sides, but when you're shopping for your wood, make sure you get smooth wood because otherwise it can grab your fabric and potentially tear it. And also get a wood with decent hardness. And when buying your wood, check your lumber, hold it up and sort of look down, down it on both angles to make sure that it's straight and there's not any bows in it because that will show up in your frame and cause all kinds of different issues. My corner joints are about as rudimentary as it gets. There is a crossbar that goes across the top that I drilled into from the top and into the vertical beams and then I just screwed the two beams together. Anytime you're drilling into your wood, make sure you always pre-drill your holes before sending your screw in, otherwise you're gonna have your wood splinter and break open and then that whole beam is gonna be ruined if the tip is ruined because then you gotta cut a new one. Dang it. Also when I did my corners, I had some 90 degree grips that held it tightly in place so I could make sure that my screws were going in perfectly straight and that the beam was gonna be perfectly 90 degree right angle for my frame. Now this type of joint itself won't really provide a lot of structure from the pl the frame kind of shifting and wobbling and that is where this cross beam comes into play. I added two beams across my panel splitting it into thirds and these serve a few different functions. For starters these brackets I installed are actually adjustable with how I screw this wood into them so if need be if my sides were a little too bowed out and my panel wasn't fitting in very snugly I could actually adjust them by loosening the screws and just squeezing the sides of the frame in and that sort of pinches both sides together and then I'm able to get the panel to fit in tighter. They also prevent the insulation from falling out the back. I don't have fabric on the back of mine to hold it in place. Just didn't see the need to double my fabric cost in this instance since I'm using the safe insulation. I also have a uh, another piece of wood which is also just some scrap wood I had laying around to give me some spacing so this will pull put, put my panel two inches away from the wall which allows sound to fall behind it and get trapped behind it and just absorb more sound even better. And then I also use this beam to mount my hanging wire which is my preferred method for hanging these things. These cross beams also just add way more rigidity to the frame and they add more reinforcement to just my regular joints on the corner and make the whole structure much stronger. Once the frame was made, I then slid my panels in and then moved on to the upholstery phase. The fabric I chose came from a local fabric store and the fabric you choose is actually extremely important to the function of the sound panel. You wanna make sure you're getting a material that is more of a loose knit so that sound can actually travel through it. If you're getting something that's too tight of a knit, then sound will just reflect off of it and not as much will be absorbed by the panel, which kind of defeats the purpose of the panel in the first place. There are many places online where you can buy fabric which is created for this exact application. I instead opted to buy my fabric from a local fabric store. And I did that for a few reasons. I'm in a more rural area, I like to support local business on any project wherever I can, help the local economy. But I like that I could also go into the store and actually handle the different fabrics, see the actual color, feel what it feels like, make sure it's got enough transparency for the sound to go through. But by doing that, I did pay for a little bit more for my fabric. Uh, you can get it a little bit cheaper in places online. 
sort of up to you how you want to approach this. Just make sure you're getting fabric that isn't going to reflect your sound. Now, stapling the fabric on was probably the trickiest part for me because I had actually never really upholstered or anything before, but I actually got the hang of it extremely quickly. So all I did was find a clean spot on my floor. For me, it was a rubber exercise mat I have in my living room that's on the floor. This also helps provide grip to the fabric to stay in place. I laid my fabric on the ground, put the frame with the insulation on top of it. For this, I actually started stapling at the top center and I worked my way out to the sides and then got my corners secured and then worked down the sides and then down to the bottom. The trickiest part is definitely getting your corners looking clean. There's different videos of people that are experts in this that show you how to do it. I sort of just laid it down and sort of just folded it in a bunch of different ways until I got it how I wanted it. And I'm pretty satisfied with the end results. Just make sure that as you're applying your fabric, you're kind of pulling it tight, not too tight to where you rip it obviously, but you wanna pull it tight to make sure that you're removing any sort of wrinkles or anything in the front. And that way you have a nice smooth surface to work with. And because I worked in sort of a top-down manner, I was able to just kind of pull it down and tight as I sort of worked through the panel. It actually ended up working pretty well, and I'm pretty happy with the end results. And once you have this, the last phase is just hanging the dang thing. So you can hang these things in all sorts of ways. My preferred method is always to use picture hanging wire. I like the wire because it's really easy to work with and it's really forgiving. And once you have the panel on the wall, it allows you to easily adjust the panel to make sure it's level. Whereas if you're using something that's a little more rigid, like fixed hooks or anything like that, you better hope that when you measure everything and drill everything the first time that your hooks and everything are perfectly level because you might not be able to level it once it's on the wall. It's also really easy with picture hanging wire to remove and add this onto a wall which is nice, so if I was doing like a sound design project where I wanted to isolate a noise more, I can take all my sound panels off the wall really easily and sort of make a little sound fort and put that around my noise source, noise source, noise source, noise source, noise source, noise source. Now an extremely important note is that I would make sure to see how heavy your panels are. Picture hanging wire, for example, such as this is 20 pounds rated. My panel is made out of pretty light wood and really light materials, so I am way under 20 pounds. But if you're making a pretty bulky panel and it's really heavy, then maybe this isn't what you want, or just make sure that you find a wire that is rated for your weight. You can also add little grips onto the back of your panel to make sure it grips onto the wall easier so that it stays level and doesn't slide out of place over time. And whatever hardware you're using to mount this onto the wall, ensure that when you're screwing into your wall that you can find a stud if you can. However, because you're probably going to want to space your panels evenly out, finding a stud all the time is not possible. And that's where getting something like a drywall anchor is extremely handy. These things are actually really handy. They screw into walls without the need for any drill. And they have a load rating of like 75 pounds. So these are awesome. And when drilling into your wall, keep in mind what your height of your panels is going to be to make sure the tops of your panels are all aligned. So a trick I like to do to make sure that all my panels are vertically aligned on the same wall is I decide what the distance between the ceiling and the top of my panel is. And then for each panel, I hold the wire up tight and I measure the distance between this wire and the top of my panel and then add that to the height of what I want for my ceiling spacing and then that's your measurement for how high to drill your hole in the wall. And with all that, you'll have a finished and mounted wall panel. Huzzah to you, good citizen. So that's essentially the whole process. If it seems too daunting to make your own panels, there are plenty of places to buy your own online. I would just shop whatever's nearest to you because shipping them does cost a lot of money. So again, if you can buy locally, you'll save a ton of money in shipping. Once I kind of calculated all the material costs that I paid for, including the materials that I got for free that I would have had to pay for, in total, I only saved probably about 25% from retail from buying one of these from somebody else. It also took me about two days to complete these panels, so if time is really precious to you and you don't think it's worth it to save the 25% on retail and you have a bunch of disposable income and don't really care, then maybe just buy one that's already pre-built. I always like to make my own stuff because A, I have a shop out back and I already have most of the materials I need, and B, is that if I know how to put them together, I can make new ones that are the exact same, that are the exact same design, and I know where I got the fabric and I know what the material is inside of it, so I'm not limited to my panel being in stock from whatever company I bought the complete panel from, so I like to build my own stuff. Hope you found this video useful. If you made it this far, I'm assuming you did. So uh, why not hit that subscribe button and stick around for more. See you later.